distinguished guests, dear friends. On behalf of the Hellenic Bankers Association UK, I would like to thank you for being here with us this evening at the LSE. A special thank you to the Hellenic Observatory of LSE that we co-host this event. And like many others that we have co-hosted in the past. Dear all, we appreciate your time and we know that you all have a busy schedule and we hope that you will find this event interesting and enjoyable and the networking reception that follows after. This evening, we debate the future of the Greek banking sector in the new economy era. Since the commencement of the Greek crisis, we have seen the 10-year Greek government bond peaking at 29.24% in early 2012. Notable signs of improvement and reflected in the yields which have remained below 5% since 2017 with a further notable reduction during the course of 2019. When it comes to Greek banking sector, we have seen total NPL ratio peaking at 49% in 2016, with a reduction to 45% at the end of 2018. Signs of notable improvement has been seen, while highest NPL ratios still remain for consumer loans, followed by business and then mortgage type of loans. We have tonight with us our panelists. Mr. Christos Megalou. Lewis, we've um, lost the slide. Uh, if we could go back to the title page then. Uh, yeah, sure. Perfect, thank you. We have tonight with us our panelists. Mr. Christos Megalou the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Board Member of the Board of Directors of Piraeus Bank SA. From 2013-2015, he was the Chief Executive Officer of Eurobank Ergasias SA, whereas he holds senior positions at Credit Suisse Investment Banking for over 16 years in London. He was also, for two consecutive runs, the Chairman of the Hellenic Bank Association in the UK. Ms. Anastasia Sagellariu is the CEO of Praxia Bank. Transforming an inspiration to reality, she has been the driving force behind the creation of Greece's first digital bank. She started her career in London in the mid-90s in investment banking, holding positions in bulge bracket firms, including Deutsche, Salomon Brothers, and Credit Suisse, specializing in credit and credit restructuring. Mrs. Sabina Jurman, who started working in Greece in 1979. She was appointed director for Greece and Cyprus at DBRT in July 2015, and she has been based in Athens since then. She successfully led landmark transactions, such as the rescue of Latvia's Parex Bank and the EBRD's first investment in Cyprus in the Bank of Cyprus. Mr. Alon Anver joined Bain Capital Credit in 2006. He has been the head of Bain Capital Credit Europe since 2009, is a managing director in distress and special situations, and a credit committee member based in Bain Capital Credit's London office. And our Chairman for the evening, Professor Kevin Featherstone, is Eleutherios Venizelos Professor in Contemporary Greek Studies and Professor in European Politics. He's also the Director of the Hellenic Observatory. Professor Featherstone, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, very much, and thank you to each of you for coming. To start, can I invite uh, Christos Megalou to make the presentation? Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, the Hellenic Observatory and uh, Kevin Featherstone for the invitation, the Hellenic Bankers Association. And uh, I'm very glad to join the uh, distinguished panel that uh, have been all operating and, and uh, working in Greece and Greek banking. I'm try to be within the limit of my 10 minutes or a bit less. So I just want to cover, you know, the uh, Greek banking, where we are where, and when we could possibly be or where we want to be. One word on the global trends. There is no doubt that what uh, we see uh, all around the world is global volatility, demographic change, technological change, social and behavioral change, and banking is obviously affected by all of this. Turning into Greece, uh, we are at a, a bit of a crossroads. After 10 years of a significant value destruction and, and a recession, a significant recession, we are actually going out of the woods by looking at the GDP growth, which uh, is uh, in 2018 uh, uh, like 1.9% expected to be 2% in, uh, in 2019. Uh, the unemployment rate going down, and uh, as we understand it continues to go down as we, as we speak. Greece becoming uh, from a consumption-based uh, society to an export-based society for the first time in uh, many, many years and uh, uh, also uh, policies that uh, liberalizing sectors and privatizations are kind of mainstream. And we see a real estate market recovery that uh, you know, is, is notable. In 2018, commercial values of real estate increased by 7%, residential values by 3%. So that's all important. On the Greek banking sector, uh, the crisis and restructuring, I just want to focus in one slide that tells it all. In, 2000, uh, in 2008, there were 21 banks in Greece. We now have a total number of nine, out of which four are called systemic banks. They are part of uh, also the, the ECB uh, systemic bank network. Employees have been reduced significantly from 67,000 to 38. Branch network significantly reduced. Uh, market is concentrated. And uh, look at the NPEs. Uh, in, in 2018, 18, 81 billion from 14 billion. A few years back, there were about 111 billion going down to, uh, uh, to this number. Now, in this environment, obviously, there is a lot of work to be done for the banks. And uh, this is what we are doing at uh, Pareus Bank. I, I did join the bank in uh, April of 2017, so I'm, I'm about two years at the helm and a little bit more. I came up with a business uh, and strategic plan as early as late May of 2017, Agenda 2020 basically uh, focusing in de-risking the bank, i.e. reducing the NPLs, that's the plan, refocusing the business of the core bank in risk-based pricing that makes sense when underwriting risks, looking at capital, uh, preserving capital uh, as much as, as I can, and actually becoming a lot more digital bank. Digital transformation in the bank as we speak is around 88% of uh, digital transactions. The MPEs, non performing exposures, we managed to reduce by eight and a half billion. And in that period, we have actually gave out 5.7 billion, 17 and 18 number this is, of new loans financing the Greek economy. What have we managed to achieve in those two years that uh, you know, we have been working as a, a new management team at Piraeus? Loan to deposit ratio, significant ratio for banking, down to 85% gives us the ability and the liquidity to finance the Greek economy. ELA, emergency liquidity assistance, from 12 billion back in 2016, zero 
as of already July of 2018, significant liquidity is actually returning to the Greek uh, banking market, not only in Pareus Bank, but all the banks as we speak. Reducing branches by uh, almost 100 from 660 to 553, going further down to 450 is the plan. Headcount at around 12,000 people from 14 and a half and looking quite good in operating expenses, reduction of almost like 15% uh, in that period, cost of risk uh, being reduced, and for the first time in uh, the last few quarters of uh, 18, first quarter of 19, turning a series of losses into uh, uh, first profitability and return on asset, only 2.3%, but we are getting stronger. Now, we are publishing Agenda 2023, the new map, roadmap for Piraeus Bank, and this is what we are working on right now. And where do we want to, to go? We want to go in, in, a, in a bank, which is the biggest bank in Greece, as we speak, from a cost income ratio of 54% to low 40s, achievable, an NPE ratio of 51%, uh, we expect to go to a single digit number by 2023, return on tangible equity from losses into a single high digit number, and from 14% of capital as we are right now to about 16%, you know, like 200 basis points above the expected requirement. The drivers of this uh, is, is going to be both the revenue increase, significant cost reduction. We have achieved 8% cost reduction in 2019 and maintaining an asset quality that gives us the top line to produce profits at the end of 2023 of about 1% return on, on assets. And we are doing all of this also with two principles uh, uh, in, 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 in place. One is a new uh, banking, uh, let's say, philosophy, bringing uh, uh, you know, the, the Pareus Bank in uh, uh, modern banking and culture that uh, you know, is, is uh, focusing on uh, accountability, meritocracy, and transparency, our principles, focusing on uh, sustainability and making sure that whatever we do in financing the Greek economy is with within that business model in a way that uh, we will be maintaining the, uh, the, the uh, uh, participating in the global initiatives, making sustainability and, and reality, and co-shaping the global sustainability strategies. All in all, uh, you know, financing the Greek economy is, uh, uh, you know, the big part of this exercise. We are uh, in a position to do it. Uh, managing our NPE and NPL, non-performing loans load, uh, is an important part of that strategy, and returning to profitability is what we are aiming for in a, in a Greek banking system that is getting healthier and stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christos, for giving us that uh, overview and indeed for um, keeping to time so, so very well. Uh, we'll come back and uh, pick up on some of the themes that you've mentioned. We would now like to move from uh, Piraeus as a systemic bank to a newcomer, uh, Praxia um, Anastasia. Okay. So good evening to everyone and um, thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be uh, here tonight. Uh, so, um, Christos did uh, an excellent uh, introduction touching upon the macro and uh, where the country uh, currently stands uh, and uh, where the uh, Piraeus more specifically, but the systemic bank, uh, banks uh, are. So, um, from my side, just a couple of, of points on, on the bigger picture. Obviously, the role also of the systemic banks uh, in the Greek economy is uh, uh, vital, and therefore, systemic solutions for NPEs and uh, the quick uh, cleanup of the system are indeed prerequisites for ensuring growth in the economy um, that we all uh, need. 
So um, the progress uh, that has been made, uh, uh, particularly for, from the Reserve Bank, is remarkable, and that will hopefully um, return uh, the banking sector and the economy into normality, which is what uh, we all uh, need. Um, so I bring a different uh, perspective in today's uh, discussion. In line with uh, global trends uh, in the evolution of uh, banking, we are introducing, um, we as Praxia, uh, together with our uh, shareholder, we're introducing um, a different concept in the Greek market, a fully digital bank, or um, a challenger bank, or a, a new paradigm bank. Uh, these are the terms that uh, are currently used uh, for um, banks like Praxia and our peers uh, across Europe. So um, what uh, we are, what Praxia is, uh, is a startup. So uh, we've built uh, something uh, from scratch. The, uh, the shareholder Atlas Merchant Capital acquired a banking license uh, about uh, two years ago. Um, but as I like to say, it was just a, a piece of paper, a license, without no, no people, no infrastructure, nothing. So we have um, built a, a bank from scratch in terms of people, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of doing the digital platform. And uh, um, we have very recently uh, started uh, being operational. Um, so it's, it's been a great uh, journey. Um, what Praxia is, is a specialized bank uh, characterized by being um, a zero legacy bank uh, with a tailor-made uh, business model and using a state-of-the-art uh, IT platform. A fully digital bank, as I said, built on an open and fully scalable uh, platform and uh, an unconventional channel bank in the sense that uh, we have and will have no branches. Um, so we will uh, use mobile industry experts. And uh, we will use uh, a partner-like uh, approach for, an, for the niche market uh, of the lower scale uh, of SMEs that, uh, that we want uh, to service. So um, these characteristics provide, uh, provide us, uh, in line with the challenger bank model, some competitive advantages versus the traditional banks in terms of lower cost income, efficient processes, thanks to the lack of a physical structure and our, uh, our digital platform, and also versus non-bank players uh, in terms of uh, higher leverage and a lower cost of funding, obviously thanks to the banking license. So effectively, uh, we are uh, introducing this new model uh, in Greece. Um, I think the closest comp is the uh, challenger banks uh, in the UK that uh, I'm sure you are uh, familiar with. Um, so uh, these are banks that do not uh, intend to challenge or rival uh, the main uh, high street banks or the systemic banks in, in Greece. But uh, we aim to profitably serve uh, the, uh, the specific market um, that we have uh, selected uh, by meeting specific customer needs. So our business model um, is uh, limited scale, focused proposition, no physical presence, low cost income, and high returns uh, on equity. So um, as I said, we've recently uh, launched. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, announced the launch of a European uh, deposit platform through a partnership uh, with uh, Raisin, um, a pan-European leader marketplace on online savings and investment products in Europe. Our agreement so far is uh, for German customers uh, with a view to expand. And uh, our launch in the local market um, will be early in the fall with a view to complement uh, the, our, uh, our entire suit, uh, suite by product suite by, uh, by December of this year. So this is a little bit about Praxia. Thank you very much indeed. I wonder, Anastasia, if I could just um, ask one follow-up question immediately. Okay. So you're a challenger bank. You decided to be a challenger bank in one of the most um, challenging markets uh, internationally. Um, why? Why did you uh, start, and, and what led you at the beginning to be confident of success? 
Well, I think that uh, the Greek banking, uh, the Greek mar bank, uh, market has seen a forced consolidation uh, in the sector. So, um, and obviously, having been the CEO of the HFSF, I had a hands-on uh, experience on, on how this happened. So, the current state, not the current state, because a lot of progress uh, has been made. But you know, um, the, we found a banking system that was, you know, the result of policy making. <coughs> So I think I don't think that you know this is the um, the topic of, uh, of of tonight's discussion, but uh, you know uh, from a textbook point of view, saying that you know we need to have four banks in the country, not three, not five, but four, was something that you know I had challenged uh, out of my role uh, as CEO of the HFSF, and I continue to challenge. So why Greece? Uh, for the reason for the reason that. Um, Yes, we have the systemic banks. Yes, the systemic banks, you know, are vital to the system, have always had a role and will always have a role. But as exactly in the UK, because the UK market as well had seen a consolidation, mm. not obviously similar, you know, to that in Greece and, uh, and in such a concise period of time, but the banks had been consolidated. And indeed, this is where challenger banks uh, were born and the model of challenger banks. So it's, it's a very simple idea. You are in a country where you have four uh, big banks that clearly, you know, have uh, their own uh, business. Um, we totally saw, uh, continue to see uh, the opportunity for building a smaller niche play that, uh, you know, will uh, introduce a different business model. Okay, and the critical point, uh, the headline here is that as the former head of the Hellenic Stability Financial Fund, HSF. HFSF, Hellenic Financial Stability Fund. Thank you. Uh, you knew exactly what you were going into, so that's even more commendable. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Sabina, uh, EBRD, tell us something about EBRD and Greece. Um, okay, well, just a, a, a quick sort of who is EBRD, European um, Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, it was set up back in 91, initially to service the economies of Central and Eastern Europe to help transition their economies from command to market. Um, I think during that period, Perestroika, Perestroika took off in Russia, and before we knew it, the Soviet Union was also a member. Then that broke up, and we had lots of other countries, added Mongolia and Turkey, and then after the Arab Spring, um, Egypt, North Africa, and uh, suddenly out of nowhere, Cyprus, mm. um, which was very unusual. I think that was 2014. Cyprus was the first country that had been a shareholder at the beginning, back in 91, alongside Greece, who thought, hang on, we could probably use some of this, this money to come into our economy. I suspect that that was what gave Greece the idea as well. So we were asked by the Greek government, um, probably in 2014, did an assessment of the country. And interestingly, when that assessment was done, um, it was decided that the Greek banking sector was absolutely fine and didn't need any help. So we were going to concentrate on the corporate sector and on um, infrastructure uh, and privatizations. Um, things take time, and you know, EBRD is owned by uh, 68 countries and two institutions. Um, so things do take a bit of time. By 2015, the government had changed, so we had to go back and ask uh, the new government if they still wanted us, because it was the previous one that had invited us. That took time. Um, and then you may remember that things got very, very shaky indeed. And I, I know when I was interviewed for the job internally at EBRD, um, I was asked, well, what, what would be your strategy when you set the office up there? And I said, well, it depends on whether we've got the drachma or the euro. So, you know, things were moving all the time. And I, at one point, I was told not to rush. Perhaps we wouldn't be setting the office open, you know, quite so quick. And then it was all. So I arrived September... Uh, actually, I went out to find somewhere to live, I think, the week the banks closed. Um, and there was a big scare. Would we, you know, be able to get food in restaurants with the shops run out? Um, moved out in September 2016, just in time to uh, get involved in the four Greek banks. And I think that was the first thing we did. We, um, we got involved in the recapitalization of all four of them. It was very, very challenging uh, back in London. I'm looking at some of my former colleagues. It was, it was a big ask. I felt it was incredibly important 
um, because we were sort of putting our flag in the ground and saying we're open for business. So there was that, and then quickly on the heels of that, we did a, um, a corp. We were an anchor investor for Otter, return to the market with a corporate bond, and then a little bit in a growth fund. So since then, so. Since then, we've done 2.7 billion in 40 odd projects and across a whole range. I won't go into the details, but I think last year was quite interesting because the smallest one we did was 1 million equity investment in the energy exchange, um, which was a requirement in the MOU. It was one of the, uh, the milestones that was going to get you know, Greece to sign off on the, the program. Um, and then the biggest one was uh, we did a syndicated loan for the tr uh, TAP, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, one billion of which we kept 500 million for ourselves. So those are sort of two, two extremes in size and in the, the sort of transactions we do. So we're, we're there to, I always say we're not there to compete with Greek banks. We can't compete with the Greek banks. You know, we don't have um, the boots on the ground. There's 15 of us now. We started with two, so we've expanded there as well. But we, we work with the banks, so we'll often do a transaction with them. Um, and then, of course, we can do equity. I mean, one of, one of the things we did uh, shortly after was um, take a stake in uh, European Reliance, which is a divestment by, by Piraeus. Mm -hmm. So I think we tend to work with them. We're, we're getting involved, leading on to the next thing, in the NPL market by providing funding for that. So we do a range of things, but n we're not competing. Um, it's becoming a very competitive environment. It has changed so much over the last four years. So uh, I think I'm... Okay, thank you. Could I just ask you to say one further comment about how you would see EBRD's role developing in the short and medium term? Um, mm. The economy needs more financing. Uh, how can EBRD help? What are the priorities? Well, in the, in the short term, we've still we've got an existing country strategy, so whatever we do sort of fits with that. It, it's fairly broad, and we can do whatever's needed. Um, We've been waiting, you know, pretty much since we started for this wave of investment demand. It hasn't been there. Very little. I mean, we got involved in the privatization of the regional airports, and that was quite a big deal then. There's a, there's a big queue of, of things that should be happening, um, presumably after the 7th of July, um, which, which I think will give us some demand. So we quite like privatizations if, we, if we're working alongside a, a sponsor. But there's not been much demand, you know, for, for the sort of investment projects that we would normally have expected to do. Um, and then we need to do a new strategy next year. So we'll wait and see what's needed. And we're only temporary. We're there at the very most until the end of 2025. Um, we've had the mandate extended by a further, it was supposed to be end 2020, it was extended by a further five years. Um, and we'll see how things go. I, for one, would be delighted if we leave earlier, because then it means that, you know, job done and we're not needed, and we leave it to Praxia and Piraeus. And would the continuation of EBRD in Greece um, be something which would, uh, you would need the authorization of the next government, or it just continues to the end of 2020? Anyway? Well, that we, was, it's going to continue to the end of 2020. I can't imagine the next government asking us to leave before then. <laughs> I think they may be quite pleased that we're still around. Whoever that government might be. Whoever it may be, yeah. OK. <laughs> Continuing the external uh, perception, Alain, uh, how does the Greek market look uh, to Bain Capital? OK. Um, so we invested in Greece uh, several times over the last five years. The, we made the first investment uh, in 2014. And that investment endured the capital controls, the, the, the large recession, the banking shutdown, and, and it's done pretty well. And then we acquired a very large and sizable portfolio from uh, Mr. Megalo's bank uh, last year, which we are working out and we're involved in a few other situations um, over there. I think if you look at Greece and you compare it to, to other markets, different markets took different approaches and it was kind of dependent on how the government wanted to work and what was the, the solvent's debt to GDP ratio. But if you look at countries like Ireland and Spain and the UK, they created bad banks, dealt with the problem relatively early, recapitalized the banks so the banks can move on with lending to the real economy uh, while someone else is dealing with, with, uh, with the negative part of, of, of the NPLs. If you look at countries like Italy, where the debt to GDP is about 120, 130 percent, 
they couldn't really do that, so they created something called GACs, which basically is securitization of large NPL portfolios and no real transfer of ownership of, uh, of the portfolio. And then in Greece, in Greece, we didn't see much. So since we bought in 2014 until 2018, we haven't seen many portfolios trading in, in the country. Um, definitely not portfolios of secured real estate, which is the bulk of what's sitting on, on the bank's balance sheet. Unsecured are easier to sell because the bank have to write them down, and therefore when the bank sells them, they, um, they can make decent money. Um, but these things have, ch uh, have changed, and one thing I'd say about Greece, Greece is benefiting from going last. Think about the, the, the circle of selling in Europe. It started with the UK, it moved to Ireland, it continued <coughs> to Spain, it's now in Italy, and Greece is, is actually benefiting from the fact that the Irish market is done, the UK market is done, the Spanish market is mostly done, and those big funds that have been raised to buy NPLs uh, looking for where they can find opportunities. Greece is actually a big opportunity. And if I think about the pricing in Greece, and I think you alluded to that, pricing in Greece moved up pretty quickly from where what I expected it to be when we were in 2017. So the realizations the banks are getting, I'm pretty sure, are better than the forecasts that were made in, in 2017. Um, what do we like about Greece or what, what other people like about Greece? Um, it's a very large market, so 100, 110 billion, depends how, how you look at it, which is probably now the second largest market in Europe in terms of ability to buy volume. Uh, something that is pretty sad, but is, is playing on our mind is Greece lost, as Mr. Megalo said, about 30% of its GDP since 2008, which is, if my numbers are correct, the third worst recession that we've seen in the last 100 years except for Argentina and, um, and 1929 in the US. And therefore, you would assume that you will see recovery. Coming from the, the, those depths of despair, um, you would see recovery. And we are seeing recovery in the real estate market. Um, I think if you go to Athens today and you compare it to when I landed in Athens in 2014, it feels a very different place. It's like if you look at Dublin in 2012 and Dublin in 2016, it's a completely different vibe and different place for the market. So we are looking at the market where it's pretty much still down. Yields are pretty high relative to other markets in Europe. Uh, we are buying cheaper than we would buy in other markets in Europe. Um, and, and we have that volume. So these are the things that, that we like. The things that we are you know, a bit more, more, more concerned about, about Greece, I'd say the regulatory environment is not highly tested. So we don't have that many examples of how you will work out consumer mortgages or how you will work out large SME loans or, or, or large corporate loans. There is some experience. We obviously had a lot of it from the five years that we'll be operating in Greece, but this is a market that is still early in, in, in its involvement. And probably the biggest thing is the debt to GDP uh, load on, on the government balance sheet. In my view, if Greece were, had 80 or 90 percent debt to GDP, it would probably grow six or seven percent GDP a year, with 175, 180 percent, um, and the banks with 40 percent uh, NPE ratios, it's difficult to grow faster. But if you look at Ireland, if you look at the UK, if you look at Spain, when you sell those NPLs or NPEs, economic growth follows, and that's something that's very important to Greece. And we are, uh, you know, we are there to be part of the solution. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Oh, I was uh, taken by your comment that, quote, the regulatory markets is yet to be tested. Uh, in Britain, we often talk about statements which are understatements. And this seems to be perhaps one of those in the sense that if we think of the uh, Commission's recent surveillance uh, report, one of the things they were uh, highlighting was uh, concerns about the MPL resolution framework, uh, etc. How big a concern is that kind of thing? So, it's a concern for us, but I think it's a much bigger concern for the banks. Yeah. Because if you think about how this kind of portfolio is priced, it's based on the value of the real estate that you buy. It's based on the cost it's going to take you to get there, to get to the asset. If, if the borrower does not want to do 
a consensual deal, and some borrowers don't want to do it, and um, the timing that's going to take you. So if you have a clear resolution situation like in Ireland where you can put stuff under receivership in three months' time, the receiver starts to manage the asset, you can sell it in 12 months' time, then if I want to achieve a certain return, I will discount it at that return for maybe a year and a half. If I need to do it for two and a half years, three years, four years, then if you look at a portfolio in Ireland that will recover for the banks 45 or 50 cents, it will recover 20 cents in, in Greece. So we still make our return. We make bigger multiples, uh, but the banks is getting a worse recovery. Mm. So if the government can shorten that period, make it clear that this is the process, all courts have the capability to enforce it, the capacity to enforce it in terms of you know, actual time to do it, um, then we can price those portfolios higher because we'll assume that we will hold them for a shortened period of time. So it is a problem for us if there's nothing. If the, usually we will take in this scenario the, maybe not the worst case scenario, but we'll take a bad scenario of how long it's going to take and we'll discount that at that level. So from, from our perspective, it's not great. Uh, but uh, to me, it's, you know, in Cyprus, when we looked at portfolios three years ago, there was nothing. So um, we learned to live with this uncertainty. If we had to do it before 2008, then there was no information whatsoever anywhere in Europe on how things are going to work. We now know how Italy is going to work, how Spain is going to work. So it's an issue, but to me, it's more of an issue for the banks than it is an issue for funds like us. Okay, thanks. Um, Soon we're going to come to questions from the audience and invite your questions and, and comments. But there's just two or three themes I'd like to raise and then invite any of you to respond to. But actually, perhaps the, the first question would more uh, relate to uh, Christos and Anastasia from within the Greek uh, banking system. This thought is prompted by the fact that as you can see, uh, tonight's event is being recorded, a podcast. The average number of downloads of LSE podcasts is in the thousands. Uh, so you, you, many people who will download this podcast uh, may not be within Greece, may not be within the UK, anywhere. Why would they download a podcast on the future of the Greek banking system? they might do so on the basis that the MPL ratio is huge, 45% uh, uh, or whatever. And then they might think, well, okay, but in the Greek uh, context, uh, Greek banks have been through four stress tests and three rounds of, of recapitalization since 2010. How come the MPL rate is still so exceptionally high? Uh, Christo, do you want to begin? Yeah, uh, the reality is that uh, not much has happened up until 2017 when a couple of things started happening post the 2015 crisis. Uh, so we started having independent servicers, which is very important for uh, the NPL market. We have about 13 that uh, have been licensed in the Greek market. We have just announced last uh, Monday the creation of the biggest independent servicer in Greece, teaming up with uh, the biggest uh, European servicing company, the Swedish company Intrum. We will be working together in uh, essentially uh, reducing our NPL portfolio, which is still a mighty 26 billion, mm. but we will be also working together in actually getting a slice of the systemic solution securitization business that is coming with what was missing in the Greek market as well, the systemic solution uh, of uh, the what is called the asset protection scheme, which will result in a GAGS uh, type Italian model securitization structures that require independent servicers all the next to follow the other systemic solution, which is the asset management company uh, who uh, uh, is being sponsored by the Bank of Greece. Now, we are very happy that we have, you know, uh, investors like Bain Capital that have been participating in the Greek market. We actually, as Pareus Bank, did the first 
sale of a secured portfolio, one and a half billion of uh, uh, an NPL, which uh, uh, portfolio which has been secured with commercial real estate. We found uh, that uh, you know a, a very professional dialogue with Bain Capital and through a lot of competition, we ended up with uh, selling it to Bain at 30 cents on the dollar, which was a, a, a decent, very good price for the first transaction that happened in Greece, only in 2018, just to mention. Other transactions have followed, and what we have now is the secondary market for MPLs functioning better. Efforts to reduce this time to recovery situation that uh, uh, Alon uh, has mentioned, uh, uh, which is basically to try and deliver the, the asset earlier to those that they need to get it. And we are now talking about 18 months time to recovery as a mainstream for most of the asset, unless you have certain specific issues. So that is also happening. There is a lot more work to be done. But uh, you know, all the banks are focusing in reducing the NPL burden. And the more players we have in the market, and the fact that Greece is an attractive market for uh, the big funds of, uh, 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 that are operating in, in, in Europe and the US. Uh, as as, as, uh, as uh, we have said, it's a very big market. Uh, it's a market that you see a lot of liquidity. Sometimes I say, if you look at this uh, Greek uh, environment right now, one of the most interesting asset classes in Greece is the NPL market, judging from the number of participants that are competing for pricing when you go out in the market. So more to be done, no doubt about that. We are in the right direction, no doubt about that. Th what, what we have is this, uh, um, in a way, uh, you know, kind of, pro is, is this a, a burden in us financing the, the economy? Is yes. not, yeah. because as Sabine said also very rightly, demand for credit is picking up, but it's not there yet. We expect Ooh. that it will be more. Okay. Anastasia, uh, given your HFSF <laughs> responsibility, uh, how would you comment about the, um, the rate of NPLs and the um, not coming down more quickly? I, I think there's not much point in dwelling as to what didn't happen in, in the past. It is true that you know, uh, time passed and you know, uh, perhaps things could have been done in a, more, in a faster way. But uh, I think you know, picking up on the points that uh, Christos mentioned, the bet for someone going back to your original question as to you know, why would someone uh, want to watch this, yes, Greece you know, still has a remarkable um, uh, you know, level right. of, uh, of, of NPLs outstanding. Um, but I think you know, a more interesting question is how quickly can now uh, the system clean up? And I think you know that for an outsider, this is uh, this is the right question. And um, I believe that uh, all the actions that are currently being ad undertaken, um, and of course, you know, uh, the systemic solution and what the, you know will be decided on that uh, will be critical. But uh, the tools are there uh, for the banks, you know, to tackle it. And I think, obviously, uh, given my previous role, you know, it wasn't the, ch the bank's choice to start recapitalizing. So, you know, let's okay. not forget the policy making. But, uh, so, uh, you know, they had to follow the route of, uh, yeah. of recapitalization. Okay. But are the conditions that prevented a more rapid decline in the MPL rates in the past now gone? Um, well, uh, the conditions are certainly better, yes. So I think, you know, we've seen improvement there. We've seen portfolios being sold. We, you know, we see active interest, uh, you know, um, uh, Bain is, uh, is here. I think you also recently uh, sold a portfolio period to, uh, to Davison Kempner as well, correct? Exactly. Uh, so, you yesterday. know, um, so, so clearly we see a momentum that previously was not there. Obviously, you know, uh, this is because the environment is uh, shaping up to be better. And I think that, uh, you know, if one wants to play uh, the Greek macro story, now you know visibility through that is better than uh, that uh, than it has been, uh, you know, year or, or two years ago. So um, 
I think that you know we can say that we are past uh, uh, all the hurdles and we're now safely looking into growth. Whether growth will be one point something or two point something, that can be debated. But you know, at least we're looking at growth. Okay. Um, so okay. yes, the conditions are better. Alon, Sabina, anything to add on this? No, I think I think it's been said. You know, we when we did the recap, I think that year I said, you know, recap. It's NPLs next year, and then nothing happened. But, you know, the whole infrastructure had to be put in place. And, and to be fair, I mean, I do, I do think the government at the time at one point talked about a bad bank, but the, you know, the institutions were not keen on letting Greece have a bad bank way back then. Um, so, you know, having that systemic sort of a, you know, sector-wide approach has come a little bit late compared to other countries. I, th I completely agree. The, the vast majority of the hurdles have been removed. Mm. Which is, if we went to Christos in 2000, beginning of 2017 and say, I want to buy this portfolio from you, and he wanted to sell it to me, I could not service it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, those so, are the services. But even more than that, it's, it's very difficult for investors like us to buy when we still see a recession, right? Mm. Because if you think about it, today we are projecting growth in Greece, which means we can pay more. If we're projecting a recession, we can pay much less. So we're going to pay even less than what, what I thought <laughs> are, are still good prices for, for investors like us in Greece today. And therefore, you, it's not an environment when you want to buy, when you want to buy assets. So it is, we needed to, I think the market had to wait for some shoots. And we saw the same thing in Italy. Italy is now not growing as fast as it did. But back in 16 and 17, we started to see, yeah, maybe it's coming out. And, Suddenly, the, the market was pushed, and I think the solution around um, GACs or GACs-like deal is an important solution. I think that is a solution that we'll need to measure in five or six years because uh, the transfer of risk is not complete with those solutions. Okay, so the economy is uh, returning to, to growth, and there are reasons to be uh, more optimistic. But over time... Uh, we think in terms of the political uh, factor. July the 7th, there are elections, there may be uh, a change of, of government. And I wonder, if we were looking over time, if you were talking to a research student here at the LSE, looking at the performance of the banking sector for the last few years and projecting uh, forward, then the political, I wonder how important the political factor is in this equation and what you might hope for from, uh, from the next government, what might be your biggest fear of, a ch of the next government? Christo, do you want to respond to this? Let me, uh, let me say that, uh, first of all, uh, it's quite important that we have elections early. Political uncertainty has been removed. It looks like that on the basis of the European election, the, there is a roadmap that you would expect uh, that things will uh, move on. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's important that uh, this happened early in the year rather than if it was to happen in, uh, in October. So that's, uh, that's a positive uh, outcome. Now, in terms of the policies, I think, uh, you know, there's no doubt that Greece has uh, has has to go uh, uh, further into a number of 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 uh, uh, restructuring, uh, let's say, actions. Uh, uh, structural change uh, should continue to happen. Labor uh, reforms are required. Taxation is still quite high. Uh, real estate taxes uh, are kind of uh, high. So, these are the kind of things that policymakers should be looking. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the future to address. And of course, uh, the, the legislative framework, there has been a lot of uh, work being done in uh, dealing with the NPLs, more needs to be done. Uh, all of it is uh, to the right direction, but uh, there is no doubt that the market is, is kind of uh, ready for uh, uh, making sure that these kind of uh, reforms are taking place. Uh, privatization plays a big role in attracting foreign direct investment. You know, we have seen uh, big projects, uh, you know, going to happen, like uh, 
the old uh, uh, Athens Airport Park. project is a seven is a seven billion project. Almost two percent uh, uh, will be the effect on uh, GDP when it's up and running. Unemployment, you know, will be uh, addressed in a way because it's it's a big employment capex uh, prog problem uh, uh, program to to follow. And of course, fixed capital formation, which is what the economists uh, uh, say when they talk about direct investment in the economy, is only at eleven percent of GDP. It has to uh, go up uh, to 22 percent to maintain a three plus percent GDP growth ratio. This is what all policies should be aiming at because we had the crisis. It was a, a big crisis, you know, one of the biggest in the world ever in economic history. We haven't seen the prices going up as quickly as they did in Ireland. Mm. So we need to see that, but in order to see that, we need to see GDP growth to 3% plus to be able also to walk our way through the crisis and, 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 and continue to grow. So these are the kind of things that the financial uh, markets are expecting from uh, you know, the, uh, the next Greek government. Thank you. Anastasia, would you like to add anything? No, no, obviously, you know, I, I agree that, you know, reforms are uh, something that um, still uh, there's a lot of progress to be made. But to your question whether, you know, the change of, uh, of government per se should have a direct impact on banking, I think, you know, the answer to that is no, uh, in the sense that, you know, banking is ring-fenced, so it's not really directly related. Um, and of, of that, I, you know, have a very firm view. O the, obviously, you know, the change of government uh, can and, and will impact, uh, you know, growth in the in the economy, uh, direction on, uh, on on foreign investment, and on the progress of privatization, which then affects, you know, banking. But a strict correlation between, you know, uh, politics and, and and banking. I think that, you know, so much has has happened on regulation and corporate governance that at uh, least, yeah. you know, it's 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 ring fenced. I was going to say the corporate governor. I, I'd forgotten about that one. The, the, it was one of the things the institutions perhaps went a little bit too far on because there's not many Greeks on the boards of Greek <laughs> banks anymore. But that might change. But there was a really big change in terms of the of the boards of the banks. And 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 I mean like MBG. You know everyone knows that the government used to appoint the chair. And yeah. that's I think that's been separated now. So. There is a, there's a distinct separation between, I think, political influence and the banks. So it will all be indirect. Alon, any, any fears as to the um, outcome consequences of the election? No, I think, listen, we, we support markets, and the market seems to tell you that the market is happy that there's going to be new elections. Um, I think if they, they should choose a course and just stick to it, we can deal, we can deal with almost anything as long as we know where we're heading, uh, whereas if, if we change direction every time, that, that, that makes it an, an, unpredictable, an unpredictable market that is difficult to operate in. But um, the market seems to suggest that they, they think the election is a good thing. Okay, good. The last theme from me, if I may, is picking up what both uh, Christos and Anastasia were mentioning. It's much more micro question. Perez. Uh, with uh, Christos as the head, is, on, is attempting to introduce culture change, changing the uh, culture and philosophy of the bank. Anastasia, with a challenger bank, uh, it's in the DNA of the challenger bank to be trying to shift uh, the culture. Sabina has mentioned, uh, she alluded to this uh, notion of the uh, de-Hellenism, it's difficult in English, de-Hellenism, uh, the uh, increasing number of uh, foreign members of, of boards. I wonder, perhaps this is a specific question for uh, Christos, if I may, uh, is that process of um, introducing more foreign members of the, the board a help or a hindrance to culture change within the institution? Yeah, I, I joined the bank in uh, 2017, in April uh, of, uh, uh, you know, that year. And, um, you know, 
I did have one-on-one -on -one interviews before I actually joined with each one of our directors at the board. They were all in place before me, and they actually, uh, you know, in unanimity elected me as, as, as the CEO of that bank. And to be honest, uh, one of the reasons why I decided to go back to Greece after, uh, you know, two years in one year in Canada, one year in London, was the fact that they I saw in front of me like a, a proper board as we have been used to be operating with in, in, in the city of London for so many years with some big figureheads in uh, uh, in, in, in banking, like uh, Karel de Buc, who used to be CEO of Dexia mm. for five years in uh, 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 crisis years for Dexia, Enrico Cucchiani, who used to be CEO of Intesa before Mr. Messina, our own chairman, George Hadzinicolaou, with career in New York and, and, and London here many years, and, and, and many others. And that was a, a comforting fact in the, in the sense that you felt that you may have to possibly, and I do feel that now, deal with the most challenging board, <laughs> given that all these guys have done it before and they know what we are talking about, but they have been extremely helpful in, in guiding and properly governing uh, this, this institution, which is now a different Piraeus Bank than ever before, in terms of actually you know, kind of, uh, you know, providing guidance on the one hand and checks and balances on the other, but letting the executive management team get on with its role and bring results. I can see that it would be a help uh, to a, a, an internationally experienced cosmopolitan uh, head of the bank coming in. Uh, I wonder how the middle <laughs> ranks of the bank feel about this. Look, uh, first of all, there is a cultural change in the sense that our official language is English, if you can believe it. You know, we communicate in English on the board, uh, and um, you know, uh, you know, it, that's that's uh, something that people now in Greece feel a lot more comfortable about because the level of knowledge of the English language across the board is very high. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, there have been significant change in Piraeus, and uh, I will lead also to the cultural change that is taking place as we speak. First of all, when I joined, out of the 11 members of the executive committee, now nine are new and, you know, mm. to our, uh, you know, part of our colleagues uh, from, uh, from uh, the older days. There have been further changes in management structures further down. A lot of the colleagues that have followed me in the bank, in actually you know, kind of restructuring the biggest bank in Greece, were more or less like uh, myself, having been working in the city of London or in New York for many years, or coming in in a Greek environment. Most of them have been in Greece already. Uh, I would have been, uh, it would have been extremely difficult to attract anyone from the city of London coming directly to join me. Uh, also uh, because of remuneration, to say the least. But I was lucky enough that I found a lot of colleagues that are willing to share <laughs> the dream to uh, lead the, uh, and transform the biggest bank in Greece. We're making a lot of progress in terms of the numbers, which is one thing, and we are very proud that uh, this is also recognized by the markets. By the way, this uh, time as we speak, we are the, uh, the banking stock in Europe with the highest returns in terms of stock market return this, this year in 2019. But the most difficult stuff, which is an ongoing effort and is continued, is the cultural tran transformation of the bank uh, from a you know, more rigid structure as, as most of the banks were. It was not only a Piraeus Bank phenomenon, mm -hmm. a bit paternalistic and kind of very direct uh, in a more open institution, a lot more uh, let's do this together kind of uh, thing. Uh, you know, you had to put the principles forward and I came up and, and this was endorsed by everybody with accountability, meritocracy and transparency as the principles that are driving the new Piraeus Bank. And of course, a lot of communication with uh, colleagues and, uh, and, and people, the cultural change of getting this thing working together is the most difficult part of the exercise, but again, we are on the right track. Many thanks.
There's a lot of expertise and knowledge in the audience. It is in collaboration with the Hellenic Bankers Association here in London. So can I uh, invite your uh, questions, comments uh, to any individual or possibly the, the full uh, panel? There are colleagues uh, in red here with the microphone. As I say, it's been podcast. People will be listening to this uh, after the event. So could you please uh, uh, wait for the microphone? And if you could just simply identify yourself and make the, uh, the question. There's the gentleman with his hand up here, please. Uh, Shaheen Valley from, from, from the LSE. Uh, I would like to return to a, a question that was asked by uh, Professor uh, Featherstone about why it took so long to repair the, the Greek uh, banking system. And you all gave very convincing explanation about the lack of infrastructure, servicing companies, the lack of a European framework, no uh, AMC, or at the time, no framework for precautionary recapitalization or no asset protection schemes. But you didn't mention the political economy also of, of, of this effort. And when all of these instruments were available uh, in 2017, there was still no rapid resolution and repair of the Greek banking system for a reason that appears obvious now, the Greek government was not very keen to, to undermine its efforts to, exist, to exit its program at the end of, of 2018. The European institutions were also peddling a story of success in Greece and were therefore not very keen to use the 25 billion euros that were left in DHFSF and that could have been used to recapitalize the Greek banking system. And finally, the Greek banks were beholden to the interest of their shareholders and were not also very keen to accelerate the process of loss recognition and recapitalization. So it seems that there was a convergence of interest that led to a delayed uh, reaction and that explains why 10 years after the beginning of this crisis, we still have a banking system with a very high, very high level of NPL that continues to be working it out. And so I have a quick question to, the, to, to the, all the panelists because I don't want to put one particular panelist on, on the spot. If today there was a lot of demand uh, for uh, NPLs, and there seems to be, um, do you think banks would be prepared to accelerate their plans to dispose of these NPLs and therefore incur a loss, and would they be prepared to recapitalize themselves? I would be very curious to have your, your view on that. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, we're going to take a couple more, uh, please, just in the interest of time. There's a gentleman right at the very front upstairs, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm from China, a visiting professor at LSE. And the uh, Greek issue is always, uh, always a heated one. And, uh, and uh, Greece is a small country with Greek culture. And the Greek crisis make it worldwide famous. And China recently become a focus as well. No matter what the world are talking about, and then the cooperation between China and Greece have been going very well. I mean that even before the crisis, I mean that when the crisis came, the cooperation goes even better. While many countries try to get out of the, the Greece, China not only stay there, but even get closer. My question is for the panel is that, what do you think of the cooperation between a big country like China and a small country like Greece? And for the bankers, is the Chinese taking part make the Greek financial market better or worse? Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, the gentleman on the second row uh, here, please. If you, Strato, if you could put your hand up. Uh, hello, that's Stratos Hatsiyanis. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yep. From uh, Hellenic Bankers Association. Uh, Intricate to the future of Greek banking is the GDP uh, progression of Greece. Mm. So the question to the panel would be, under what circumstances does the panel think that GDP can break out of the 1.5-2% increase in the next three to four years uh, to rates more ambitious, I wouldn't say the range, but well above 3%, uh, 
and uh, what are the conditions for that to happen. One of them could be the uh, sort of free negotiation of the surplus to the GDP. Many thanks. Uh, I wonder if we start with um, Shaheen Valley's uh, comments about uh, NPLs. Anastasia. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the points that you made are all valid. Um, however, I'd like, you know, to pose back a question. It's easy to criticize, uh, you know, sort of, I, I was in a public sector uh, role. Uh, obviously, I'm not part of the systemic banks. I'm do doing something new. But it's always easy to criticize, uh, you know, um, the others. They haven't done it fast enough. They haven't done it well enough. Well, here's a question. Has any country ever addressed a similar situation where, you know, you have uh, four systemic banks, which are the result of forced policy making, uh, who, that had no choice as to how to tackle the issue and got forced out of policy making, you know, um, to tackle uh, NPLs in this way. So I think that if, the, if it was a banker's choice and if, you know, the CEOs of the banks had been called back then and had been asked whether, you know, they want to approach this this way, I'm not sure that they would have agreed to it. In fact, you know, uh, not being a policymaker and bringing on the table uh, the banking expertise, I said, you know, has it ever been done in any country before that you first re recapitalize and then you solve NPLs? You have examples of the countries where, you know, they solved the NPL issue first and then recapitalized. But a similar example to Greece doesn't exist, uh, you know, as far as I'm, I, I am aware. So, you know, has it taken a long time? The answer is yes, you know, uh, and, you know, with all due respect uh, to, you know, to Christos that, you know, obviously we worked with before and there's huge mutual respect. Could they have done something different? As I said, easy to criticize, I'm not sure. So, you know, every time someone says that, you know, what I tend to say is, okay, and if you were in the shoes of the CEO of Piraeus or Eurobank or Alpha or NVG for that matter, you know, what could you have done differently? So, yes, valid criticisms, but I think, you know, your, the question that you're raising is more fundamental. Was this the right approach? And this is this an example by which, uh, you know, I hope there's not a similar type of situation ever again in any other country, but if there w was, would you lead by this example? Because this was a successful example of how to put the banking sector back on its feet. Crystal. <clears throat> the comment to make is that we've been through this, decisions were made, we're dealing with the, uh, uh, the situation as we, as we speak. Are we dealing in the best possible way? I think by and large we do, in the sense that, you know, we have a timeline of reducing our NPLs. Uh, we have shareholders and some of our private uh, shareholders have put a lot of money in this recapitalization, so mm. I would say no recaps, more recaps, please. <laughs> we don't need any more recaps in this stage. What we need to do is let us do our job in terms of, you know, work out the NPLs in a, uh, you know, like reasonable and rational way and manner, which is what happens. And uh, uh, does that, is, is this hindering us in financing the Greek economy? That's an absolute no. We can finance the economy as, uh, as, as we speak. And if, if policymaking addresses the growth uh, rate with the help of the credit that we will be providing, credit is available for growth of 3%, 4%, and we will see that happening. Thanks, uh, uh, Christo. You mentioned uh, previously uh, schemes to bring down the MPL ratio. If I understand correctly, the Greek banks are committing themselves to bringing down the NPL ratio to something like 20% by the end of 2020. Is that realistic? Correct. That's is, correct. Is that realistic? Yes. It is realistic. It is realistic. It's based on past experience. Take, for example, Piraeus Bank, uh, uh, as an example, last year we reduced our NPEs by 5 billion, 
which is an absolute number, is, is quite significant. Mm. One and a half billion was what uh, uh, you know, uh, Bain Capital has uh, bought in that process. Uh, other transactions have followed. Organic uh, reduction of NPEs through collections, liquidations was, was also happening in, in our portfolio. The target between now and 2021 is 15 billion on the basis of past experience. We can do it. And this is what we are working on. Is it easier for us to do it? Yes, we have now a secondary market for NPLs with uh, all these uh, participants willing to provide financing. We will have soon the systemic solutions, the asset protection scheme, the GAGS-like scheme that will be almost creating in the next three years about 25 to 30 billion of securitizations. So this is all gonna be helpful and to the right direction. Okay, good, thank you. I wonder, um, Sabina, in your uh, previous comments, you said that uh, the demand uh, for investment loans in Greece is very low. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, the question from uh, Stratos Hatsianis talking about what Greece would need uh, to break out of this uh, growth path at the moment of 1.9 or 2% and get it up to something much higher. What would you advise on that? I, uh, confidence, and I think we're seeing a little bit now. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's been a, sort of the enthusiasm over the last two weeks. That doesn't mean that there's hundreds of people queuing at our door for loans, but I get a sense that people may start dusting off some of those investment plans because they're confident that there will be um, a more business-friendly government that will look at taxes, um, and I do think you know, the, the, the infrastructure, the privatizations, Helene Khan is huge. Mm. When all of those start coming in, you know, the, 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 the knock-on effect is, is enormous for SMEs. I think we saw that with TAP across northern Greece. You know, mm. So many SMEs benefited from that. If you have three, four, five, six TAP-like projects, then I think we may get that growth. But you, first of all, you need confidence, because otherwise, why are, why are people going to do it? Alon, before you were saying that the politics didn't really matter because the markets had factored in uh, that uh, whatever happens in the election, uh, there's a government which is going to follow a path which is uh, current. Um, Sabina is saying that um, last few weeks, expectations of a more uh, market-friendly, growth-friendly uh, government what would you say in terms of how uh, Greece might uh, get onto a, a better growth strategy and what the expectations from outside might be? I think politics matters, but you know, I'm not a, an expert on, on politics. What I said is that we can adjust to whatever the politicians would decide as long as they, they go in a certain way. And, uh, look at the UK now, right? The UK is a difficult environment to invest despite this being a a, a country with great regulation and great entrepreneurship and you know a lot of great things happening, but I don't know what Brexit looks like. No. So yeah. what well, assumptions well, should I make? All so those, the all those the, the politics obviously matters. Uh, I think there are a few things that we kind of discussed, we kind of didn't discuss, but with 175% to 180% debt to GDP on the sovereign, it's, it's difficult to know for an investor in which direction this economy is going to go. Yeah. Uh, that is a political question. This is not a question for me on, on how this is going to be resolved. And um, that affects the banks, that affects the rates that the banks have to pay for their financing, that affects the desire of people to, to invest in, in Greek's bank and, and, and Greek businesses as a whole. So if I think that Greece has, a, as I, I said it several times, if, if I think Greece has a good runway, I'd be willing to pay more for assets that I buy here because I think that their value is going to increase because I think that the rent income that I will get is going to get higher. Um, so, so these are the things that are, that are important to us. So politics is important for us. As I said, we can adjust. We invest in Spain, we invest in Portugal, in, uh, we, we invest in, we had like three elections over the last four years in, in Spain. Uh, we invest in Portugal, we invest in Italy, which had some volatility over the last two years. So we can adjust to it. Okay. Um, you know, the question around the bankers, it's, it's so multifaceted in terms of what led to this. 
or, and that it's really, it's a political question. It's not, a, okay. I don't think it's a real banking question. There was a question about China. Um, how much of a help collaboration between uh, Greece and China can be to future growth? I don't know if anyone would wish, to, uh, Christoph. Well, I, I was always very interested to see that one of the most successful investments in uh, uh, Greek privatizations was the Costco investment in the port of yes. Piraeus. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, there's no doubt that there has been a, a, a big success. This was foreign direct investment. A lot of things have happened. Uh, the the uh, uh, freights that are being going now through these uh, uh, terminals are uh, remarkably high. So Pareu suddenly became one of the gateways for Europe. Rail travel follows up. So uh, hands off to you know the team at Costco and uh, together with the Greek government, successive Greek governments that they managed to have a very successful investment in our hands. Then look at also the uh, real estate market. Athens is, is, kind, of, uh, uh, is, is kind of enjoying, uh, 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 especially in the small flats, uh, you know, kind of market uh, uh, investment by Chinese uh, nationals that are coming in for the residents and also buying the 250,000 plus flats that is the price for, uh, for this uh, uh, residence and so on. So there's no doubt that there's a lot more to happen. But uh, of course, this is a, a, a big trade partner now of Greece. And, and of course, we, we, we have to try and do more. Excellent. Of course, Brexit may be um, a bit <laughs> of a, a help to Greece as well. Um, there must be some silver linings somewhere. Let's, uh, more questions, comments, uh, please, from the uh, audience. Could we take the question over here? We'll have to try to speed up, uh, please. Hello. Uh, Paris Andrianopoulos from AIMCO. Uh, the question is about uh, external threats in the next five years uh, with regards to the Greek recovery, be it Brexit, be it late cycle, be it Tariffs, what is your comment about the threats to a recovery for Greece? Thank you. Okay. And there was other questions. Uh, this uh, right at the very back. And then we're going to come over here. Yep. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Um, Yanis Isopoulos from UBS. Uh, that's the question actually targets more um, Mr. Anastasia. Uh, you are a digital bank, and that's your strategy actually going forward. How do you tackle the external threats, especially around cyber? Because you know, the, the digital transformation of the banks actually is quite a, quite a significant uh, change for the banking industry. Thank you. Okay, great. There were some hands up here. Yeah, uh, the two gentlemen um, on the same row, I think. Yes, good evening. My name is Costas Stelios. I work for a prominent wealth management firm. Um, my, question, my, my question really is to identify the elephant in the room, which is with the new government coming in, surely it's going to be better for the Greek economy to implement a strategy of relaxing its um, austerity measures in order to stimulate growth and to be able to bring Greece out of negative equity in order to sell all these assets that are in negative equity. And that's for the panel. Okay, there's a gentleman Thank next you. to you. Hello, Jens uh, Vasilakos, Deutsche Bank. And to touch upon what, your, what uh, um, the gentleman said then, with the title, The Future of the Greek Banking System, uh, as you know, the most important asset is, uh, is our people. And we've got a room full of uh, Greeks, that some of them are very keen to, to go back. I know that obviously there's an element of the government and how the politics are going to play out for people to return. Mr. Megalus uh, said how lucky he was to kind of have colleagues to persuade him to, to go back. But how do you see your institutions trying to kind of persuade the people here to kind of think about maybe uh, living in a hub like London and returning back to, back to Greece? Because Without the people, I don't see real growth uh, 
happening. Okay, good. We're short of time. I'm going to invite uh, each of the speakers to pick up on any particular question. Please don't feel that you have to answer each of the questions. Uh, Backwards? I'm sorry? Can I go backwards and talk about the brain drain? Please do. I, it's just because, we, you, you know, we do ad, we're not huge. We're not going to solve the problem of Greece. We do advertise from time to time, and we get a huge number of Greeks um, that have been living abroad during the crisis who really want to come back. And, and when we interview them, it's usually, well, I'd only come back if I'm, I'm working for somebody, you know, like your organization. So it's the quality of the job. And then I, the other thing, there was a, there was a survey um, uh, of Greeks living abroad, and, and the question was, what would bring you back? And one of the, the ones that was cited most often was, was the, to work in a, um, an environment where, without any corruption. You know, so they, they and I, I wonder which sectors that, that is um, coming from, but I, I think that, you know, people are changing. They don't want to be in a system um, that was, we had in Greece for so many years. Alan, do you want to pick up on any of the comments? I just say, if you know how to work out loans in Greece, give me a call. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we're looking for people who, are, who can do that, who are motivated. Uh, it's actually pretty difficult to find um, to, to find uh, people who have experience in that space. So if you're done it in other countries and you're you're willing to work hard and you're interested in, in, in joining a group like us, let us know. Um, There's an earlier question about uh, identifying the external threats. Do you have any comments on that? I think the threats that were mentioned are not specific to Greece. I think they're universal. So Brexit and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually more worried to, for Italy than I'm worried for, for, for Greece at this stage on, 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 on external threats. I think, again, the, the, with this level of debt, it's very difficult to be flexible. So if we have another crisis, who's going to recapitalize us next time? So that, that is, to me, a, a key element for, that needs to be resolved. And um, other threats are similar to what other markets okay. are seeing. Um, you know, if, if GGBs start to move up because the market gets nervous about, about uh, Greece again, then you will see that pricing of NPL portfolios is going to go down again. Because people would always say, okay, do I get a good premium relative to, mm. I can go and buy GGBs, it's a liquid security, I can, and I'm secured by, by, by the state. Is it, what's better for me to do? So, um, I, to me, that is a key element. Okay. Anastasia, there was a specific question about cyber threats. Yep, there was a specific question on cyber threats. Um, so the answer, yes, of course, you know, this is a, a, a very uh, valid uh, and, and, and hot topic. Um, the advantage of, you know, building uh, something from scratch, uh, a digital platform from scratch, is that, you know, you have uh, the opportunity to select uh, the best uh, in class, uh, you know, for your core banking system, for your digital platform, you know, how you do... Um, uh, uh, you know, your integration and, and, and the omnichannel, how you do your cyber and everything. So the answer, is it a concern? Of course. Uh, I, and I think that's a concern whether you are a digital bank or, you know, a, a traditional bank. Um, we have selected the best in class and, uh, you know, we have a state-of-the-art uh, platform. So, you know, I think that we have done everything uh, in our power to uh, proactively address it. Now, on the question on on people, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Praxia started uh, from zero. We're currently 180 uh, employees, and we will be about 400 uh, within five years. So uh, we are hiring. Um, we're actively advertising. So you know, please uh, check uh, our site uh, uh, for positions uh, and. Indeed. This is the first time the LSE has been a platform for <laughs> uh, employment abroad, but uh, do carry on. <laughs> exactly. Um, and indeed, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, members uh, in the team that, you know, have, um, have come from, uh, from abroad. So, you know, people, are, I, 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 you know, from my team, I can certainly tell you that, you know, people are, are, are actively looking and some are choosing to, um, to come back. So. Uh, Kevin, for, for, uh, for us, uh, is, is, is very important, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to say that we are actively uh, of helping as much as we can in 
focusing first of all in, in stopping the brain drain. Mm. There's no doubt that you know Greece has suffered. A lot of young talent has left the country. We are actually doing uh, what we have, uh, uh, you know, called Project Future, which is uh, uh, now in its second uh, uh, year of operation. About 1,300 graduates out of Greek universities that we train over a series of months, and then 300 of them we place, some of them with uh, the bank, some of them with uh, some of our partners, some of them with, with uh, 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 you know, other, other companies in the country in, a, in an effort to give them employment for six months at uh, a minimum wage of 700 euros, uh, which is not bad actually, higher than the minimum wage yep. in, in Greece, and get them into the uh, employment market. We have seen a lot of young talent that uh, are participating in these projects. You know, it's our contribution in actually helping, you know, a lot of these uh, young kids not going out. And we have also, uh, as well, you know, kind of employed a lot of people that, you know, came of, uh, for, uh, from abroad. Uh, but in my view, the most important stuff at this stage is, of course, to stop the brain drain. The economy will grow and then things will be better. Okay, before I invite you to thank each of our uh, speakers, can I just make two uh, quick uh, announcements? Uh, with thanks to the Hellenic Bankers Association, you're all invited to join us for a wine reception, which is in the atrium. As you leave the theatre, if you turn left, eventually you come to the <coughs> atrium, and uh, the reception is an opportunity for us to discuss more informally, for you to uh, discuss with our panelists uh, as well. We're very uh, pleased that we've been able to collaborate once again with the Hellenic Bankers Association. It's obviously an important topic. We're very pleased that you've uh, joined us this evening. In the next academic year, uh, we plan some events where we'll be looking back the 10th anniversary of the start of the Greek uh, crisis. Uh, to get us off to a start in the uh, new academic year, we hope to be hosting Poole Thompson from the IMF uh, to look back at um, the Greek uh, crisis. Uh, hopefully we can uh, collaborate uh, with the association on that and uh, hopefully <coughs> you'll be interested to come back and to pursue those uh, conversations. Poole Thompson hasn't been to Greece in uh, a number of years. I don't know why. <laughs> His, <laughs> but he is going to come uh, to the LSE, but, and we're very grateful uh, for that. But I think with, uh, this discussion, to me, has been very informative. Uh, thank you for your uh, questions and comments. Can you please uh, join me in giving a very warm uh, thank you to each of our speakers? <laughs>